let's say the villages around run out of water. You think they're just going to sit there and die? All studies clearly point out towards a serious water strife, but the important action that is needed right now is this, that we need to raise seventy-two crore saplings in the next four years. We are very happy to announce that the Karnataka Premier League, KPL, will be partnering with Rally for Rivers, Kaveri Calling, and will make this movement as their social cause partner during this KPL season. And now, to introduce today's speakers, Kale Rahul, one of the most favorite cricketers from this city. He began his test debut, or did his test debut, in 2014 in Australia. He's a wicketkeeper, come batsman, as you know, and currently plays for Kings Eleven, Punjab in the IPL League, and he has many firsts to his credit. He became the first Indian to score a century on one-day international debut. Rahul has also set the record for the fastest Indian batsman, or fastest batsman to have scored centuries in all three formats in just 20 innings. And Sadhguru is one of the leading batsmen of the country, now batting strongly for the environmental causes, perhaps the only light that we have. Before I uh, invite the speakers onto the stage, um, so today the conversation between Sadhguru and Rahul will last for about an hour, after which you will have an opportunity to pose your questions for the next 30 minutes. Thank you, and with that I invite Sadhguru and Rahul onto the stage. Namaskaram, and uh, because just because she said I am some kind of a batsman, don't bowl a googly to me. Huh? I am not. <laughs> I haven't played cricket in ages. <laughs> so the balls that I miss, anyway, you catch. <laughs> uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so first, want to say it's a huge honor to be here on stage with you. Um, we all know what a big youth inspiration you are, and the things you're doing for. For, for the environment is just just inspiring all of us and uh, um, I was just telling uh, your colleagues that I've, I've read your book and uh, um, I've been trying to, uh, at least I'm trying to do little things and uh, just a huge inspiration and uh, I'll focus back to what we're here today for. Uh, uh, so happy that uh, you started this campaign to, um, you know, help River Kaveri and, and um, I just want to ask you how big a responsibility is it to revive a river and how do you plan on doing it single-handedly? <laughs> Definitely I'm not planning single-handedly. <laughs> the reason why we are uh, doing many things and including this is Without uh, a large-scale people's involvement, this is not going to happen. This is not a single-ended job. This is not just my work or your work or somebody else who is here. This is a generational work. As a generation of people, we have taken the largest bite out of this planet. Never before another generation has consumed as much as we have. So, I'm just thinking, before I fall dead, let's fix it to whatever extent we can so that uh, future generations don't look back and see we were the most irresponsible generation ever. In a way we are, unfortunately. Because uh, the way I saw Kaveri fifty years ago, or let's put it this way, the way the previous generations gave Kaveri to us and how it is today, if we hand it over like this, this means we are a disastrous generation. So I want to see that we are not a disastrous generation, we will fix it to whatever extent we can. Nobody should say, we have not done what we should have done. Because in our lives, 
if we do not do what we cannot do, there is no problem. But if we do not do what we can do, we are a disaster. So I don't want to be that, that disaster. I want to ensure none of these people, the people of this generation are not a disaster, that we will do everything we can do. And, and how do you... What do you think is responsible for all of this that is happening and what is your advice to youngsters like us or... I, I remember I was in UK for two months and I did, didn't know that there was a water problem and I came home uh, three, four days ago and my sister told me that... She told me, don't use the shower, use the... <laughs> uh, use the bucket of water, you know, it's... I've, so many of us are unaware of, of, of situations and can you throw some light on how this has happened and what we can do? <laughs> See, uh, there is no one agency or one force or one person to blame. It is just that fundamentally it's ignorance. The most basic ignorance about rivers is people think river is a, a source of water or a well is a source of water or a pond or a lake is a source of water. In a tropical country, it is not a source of water it is only a destination for water. There is only one source of water for us, which is the monsoon rain. That's the only place from where water is coming. So the, the rain that comes down, which normally happens to us in this country, somewhere between forty-five to sixty days maximum in a year, rain pours down on us. A huge volume of water comes down. When this comes down, our ability to hold it in the soil will determine how many days in a year will the rivers flow. If we hold it, then it flows 365 days. If we do not hold it, it will run away within the next fifty or hundred days and that's why it's going dry right now. So what allows us to hold the water? The only and only thing is vegetation. There is no rocket science to this. This has been my main mission across the world, including United Nations, our government, central government, all the states. We convince them, you cannot hold water in a dam, check dam, barrage, all these things. These are all okay for usage, but you cannot really enhance water like this. The only way you can hold it is by vegetation. When I say vegetation or let's say forest, the possibility of increasing the forest cover is impossible in India. We are 1.3 billion people, it's estimated by uh, 2030 we will be 1.5 billion people. So there is too much pressure on the land, there is no way to increase the forest cover. The only other way is to go for agroforestry, that we use forests as a livelihood for ourselves. We grow forests for wealth, we grow forests for economic reasons. When I say we grow forests for economic reasons, right now in the world, the timber market in the world is over three hundred billion dollars. Are we sending any timber to any part of the world? No. But we are importing nearly seventy thousand crores worth of timber. And we are importing about one point two lakh crores worth of timber products. So nearly two lakh crores worth of foreign exchange is going out. Even the timber we are getting is largely not certified. That means somewhere somebody is cutting forests. This one thing we must understand, wherever they cut it, it's going to hurt us. Doesn't matter whether they cut it in South America, South America or Africa, wherever they cut it, in some way it is hurting us, it may not hurt us tomorrow morning, but it will hurt us after a few years. So, one thing is, it is a great economic plan for our farmers, because our farm situation is such, in Karnataka, seventy-one percent of the farmers are in distress loans. In Tamil Nadu, eighty-two percent of the farmers are in distress loans. What a distress loan means is, the person who has taken the loan has simply no means to pay back. So he is distressed. It is like if you're earning ten rupees, you took a two rupees loan and we see that you can pay back. You're earning ten rupees, but you have taken a hundred rupee loan, 
we know that there is no way for you to pay back. And interest is multiplying. So the only thing he can do is default or run away or sell the land or hang from a tree. This is a tragic condition in the country, where in the last fifteen years, over three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide, three hundred thousand. The four wars that India has had, three with Pakistan and one with China, three hundred thousand people did not die and both the sides put together. Our soldiers and the enemy soldiers put together, three hundred thousand did not happen, but that's the number of farmers who have died in the last ten to fifteen years' time. So, this could escalate big time or total breakdown of social and economic situations can happen because sixty-five to seventy percent of the population in this particular trade called agriculture. And there is uh, no scale to agriculture because land holdings are so small. So, we have converted nearly… nearly seventy thousand farmers in Tamil Nadu. Every year we are adding a few hundred farmers converting into agri… agroforestry. We could go like this, but it would just take maybe another two to three generations before we achieve what we want to achieve. So right now, Kaveri Kaling is an effort where I want to crush the time. In twelve years' time, we can do this if the necessary economic incentives come from the government. To one part, till we achieve fifty percent success, if there is economic incentive, after that even that will not be necessary because people will see how beneficial it is. On an average in Karnataka, they are earning forty-four thousand per hectare per year. In Tamil Nadu, they are earning, earning around forty-six to forty-eight thousand. But within the first five years, the first five-year average is three-point-two lakhs per hectare. This is what the agroforestry people are earning. In the first ten years, it's four-point-six lakhs per hectare. In fifteen years' time, it is thirteen lakhs per hectare. This is how they're earning. If once every farmer sees that this is the kind of benefit he has, even a part of his land, if he goes in for agroforestry, he will not need any kind of bank loans. When we come to bank loan, we must understand well, uh, you're a young man, you have not seen these things. When we were young, in 1969, when uh, government of India nationalized all the banks, you come from Mangalore or… Yes. yes. So, a lot of banks started from Mangalore, Canada Bank, Syndicate Bank, what is the other one? Hmm? Vijaya Bank, all these. All these things were nationalized. What… nationalization is a nice word. What it is, is we just took all your wealth without any compensation. You understand? You're running a bank, that means you had a few thousand crores, but we just took it, the nation. Such a cruel act we did because we wanted to ensure that the rural populations have access to banking. And it made a huge difference, it's been a revolution in the country. But now what is happening is, the solution that we have for farmers' distressed loans is, Whenever the election is coming, every state is going about saying, no need to pay back the loan. See, it's very simple. If I give you hundred rupees and somebody comes and says, you don't have to pay him back. All right, I lost my hundred rupees. Next time, even if you say I'm dying, I will not give you ten rupees. Yes or no? Hello? Is this not the way society will work? If… if it is assured that you're not going to pay me back, even if you say it is the most dire emergency, I'm not going to give you a rupee anyway. This is what is happening once again. Once again, we're pushing the farmer back into the money lender's hand, where the interest rate is sixty to seventy percent per annum. This is a clear death knell for the farmer if he falls back into the hands of the money lenders once again from proper banking. This whole revolution, of nationalization of banks and making rural e economies to be flush with banking money is being destroyed right now. But if agroforestry comes in with a little bit of support from the government, the farmer need not go to the bank, he will have enough money. And this is not a new idea or a concept. If those of you who are old enough, you're old as Siva, you're old. <laughs> 
You've been around all the time, since I was born <laughs> So, <laughs> people know that in southern India, in any agriculture land, always there were minimum twenty-five to fifty trees, always, at least on the boundary. Actually in Karnataka, I have seen people used to name the trees after their daughter, their son and whatever because when this tree grows up, this was generally planted when the child is born and w this is named after the girl. When this girl grows up and she needs to marry, she is eighteen, twenty years of age, now this tree is ripe. If I cut this tree, her marriage is taken care of. Those days I know eight to ten thousand rupees they get out of a tree, marriage is taken care of. Son wants to go to the university, his thing is taken care of. So this was the economy of the rural places. I know this very well because at that time I was on the farm, uh, you know, I was actually in agriculture. About forty years ago, massive usage of chemical fertilizer started. I have seen this agents from fertilizer industries coming and campaigning, you have to remove the trees because the trees are sucking out all the fertilizer, it will not go to your crops, the trees are taking away because of their aggressive root system. So crores of trees across Karnataka was felled. Today, if you fly from Bangalore to Delhi, every five minutes you look down, it's a brown desert that you see, except Western Ghats. Rest is just one brown desert from here to Delhi all the way, yes or no? What is our plan for this country? Because you can only retain monsoon water. See, we are trying to do things as European countries or North America does. We must understand they have glacial water, they have snow, water coming from snow. Snow sits for two if two feet, next two months it slowly melts and make sure it percolates. Our water is not like that, it comes in a downpour. If you don't have vegetation, it'll just run away, not just run away, it'll take the topsoil and run away. That's what is happening right now. So, Kaveri is not even touching the ocean for six and a half to seven months in Tamil Nadu. So, Tamil Nadu people are thinking, Karnataka people are drinking up too much water. Yes, <laughs> they think Kannada people are drinking too much water, they want to fight with you. They have to come upstream and see, here also there is no water. So I was just talking to the Tamil farmers, I said, yes, this fight is… You Sadhguru, you must tell them to release water. I said, all this fight is fine, and just wait for another twenty years. There will be no fight because there will be no Kaveri in Tamil Nadu. Yes, that's where it's going. On an average, where the Kaveri goes dry, what point it goes dry, on an average, it's withdrawing three to eight kilometers per year. That means, Right now, it's about four hundred plus uh, kilometers in Tamil Nadu, the Kaveri is running. Probably in another forty years or fifty years, it will not even enter Tamil Nadu. That's how serious it is. But, so, so you, what, what, I'll go back to your thing about farmers and you spoke about loans and things. I just want to ask, what can a common man do to help farmers? Or if, if, I'm not a bank, but if I want to, go with a set of friends and help the farmers, what do I do? So right now, uh, to assist the farmer to shift to agroforestry, there are a few things to happen. One thing is the saplings, large-scale development of saplings. We are looking at in twelve years to plant two hundred and forty-two crore trees, that is two point four two billion trees. If we want to do something so massive, it needs a very organized effort and it needs a certain agility, which normally, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but normally the state governments don't have such an agile machinery to act. So in Tamil Nadu, we have about thirty-two uh, nurseries spread across Tamil Nadu. So we've planted over thirty-five million trees in the last uh, eighteen years, all on our own steam. That is, no government help, no nothing, just as a movement, people's movement. Now this needs to scale up big time. So we, are, we have clear-cut plans how to multiply this. Today there's tissue culture, we have all the technologies, everything 
you know, we've assimilated all these things properly. Now to act, we are looking at taking in all the aspects. It costs about forty-two rupees per sapling. In the first phase of four years, we need to plant seventy-two crore trees. If uh, you can campaign a little bit on your bat, if you can have Kaveri calling forty-two rupees. <laughs> Every run you score, you tell your fans to plant one tree. I'll do that. <laughs> Whatever I'm saying, whichever way you think is appropriate. Like this, everybody must do what they can. As a sports person, you do what you can, as whoever. I'm saying even if you're a beggar on the street, you still can plant one tree a year at least. Isn't it? Forty-two rupees. Even a beggar can do it. So, it is not a question of resource, it's a question of how concerned we are. So, this is only one part of it. We raise the saplings. It takes eighteen to twenty-four months to get the saplings to planting stage. So, we want to start now, the, it's been just launched yesterday, we will move. In September, we're doing the rally, riding about fourteen to fifteen hundred kilometers and having about eight hundred and sixty-five events have been planned along the way. We're a little crazy about these things, how <laughs> So, uh, this is one part. The next part is to put enough pressure on the government. We have spoken to the Jal Shakti minister, most probably he may come and flag off the event. The environment minister, important thing is to release the trees. Releasing the trees means in this country, if you grow a tree on your own land and you cut it, tomorrow you can get arrested, okay? <laughs> so, we got eighteen species of trees released that if you cut them, there is no problem. But still high-value trees are not released. I am saying, I have put this to the central government, the laws should become like this. Right now there are laws, these are British-made laws. You know, the English <laughs> They made these laws that if you own the land, you own only the top eight feet of soil. Beneath that, it belongs to the government. So most people do not know this, the water in your well actually belongs to the government. Today, Tamil Nadu is exercising this right. They are saying if you want to hit a bore well, you need government permission. You cannot dig a well in your land as you feel. You have to take a license, otherwise they will not let you take the groundwater because it belongs to the government. I am pushing for a law, anything that's in my land should belong to me. If I hit water, oil, gold, diamond, whatever the hell is there in my land should belong to me, it should belong to the farmer. So if I'm doing badly, it belongs to me, if I do well, it belongs to you. What kind of law is this? <laughs> so. Only if we hit some civilizational aspects, let's say I'm digging and I found uh, Manjadaro in my land, then you can come and take it. Any wealth must belong to me, you can tax it, but you can't take it, isn't it? You should not be able to take it, but right now that's how it is. So we're pushing for loss like this, above all, all trees, whatever I grow, as I cut my paddy or sugarcane or whatever else, Similarly, whatever else I grow, I must be able to cut it. Right now, we've been talking to various governments and these funny things are happening. I was talking to one of the chief ministers and I said, this kind of laws must go. He says, I don't think there's a law like that. I said, please ask your forest minister or secretary. So he called the forest secretary and he put it on the… what… Uh, the speaker phone. And uh, he asks, uh, like this, is there a law like this? He says, no, 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 there is no law against cutting the tree. Then he says, no law. I said, is it true? I can't cut a tree and take it, right? Ah, yes, yes, you cannot transport it. <laughs> what am I supposed to do, have my own cremation in my land? <laughs> I cut a tree and I cannot transport it. Was it… what is it? It's for my cremation or what? I'm storing up. I'm saying a tree is a wealth. The wealth should belong to the farmer, this is very important. So as a part of this, we are pushing for a timber board. As there is a coffee board, tea board, other things, 
We want people to understand that timber need not necessarily be a forest produce, it can be an agricultural produce. That's what we want to change the picture. Sadhguru, we know with Kaveri depleting, it is going to cause a lot of problems for Karnataka and Tamil Nadu for sure, but why would a different state want to, want to help? <coughs> Do you think people do? I'm, I'm sure people do think like that. They see yes, your yes. troubles, you face it. Why, why do we have to help you? Uh, but we must understand this, that uh, this is not just Kaveri's problem. Krishna has depleted over seventy-seven percent. Godavari has depleted over forty-two percent. Narmada has depleted over sixty percent. Ganga has depleted over thirty-seven percent or so. So it is not one state's problem or two states' problem. It is all over the place. Only thing is, if we successfully demonstrate that you can turn the river around, a major river, we are doing a small river in uh, Maharashtra, we are very confident we'll do that. It's a fifty... fifty-four kilometer stretch of Vagari River in Yavatmal. Yavatmal has been considered, unfortunately, as the suicide capital of this country. So, this is a small space, we've taken that up as a first project, already state government is involved, very proactive state government and four hundred fifteen crore budget has been put on it. This will be so, in another four to five years, we will ensure even now, these nine thousand six hundred families who are in this region, we've put volunteers there, everybody has a helpline, that if there is any distress, they can call. So, we will definitely stop suicide within the six months to one year, we're already on the ground. But we will turn the river around in about six to eight years' time, Vagari, because it's a small river. Kaveri is a substantially large demonstration. If we do this one thing, then you can do this for every river in the country. So why start in Kaveri? You have to start somewhere. Hello? <laughs> you have to start somewhere because we always start from Kanyakumari. We're starting from Kaveri, <laughs> from south. And uh, in many ways, we are attempting Kaveri because uh, this is a population which is most conducive for something like this. Another reason is, this is a river which is flowing through just two states. Most of the rivers are flowing through four, five states. Getting those four, five states together is a much more complex affair rather than these two. And these two states, right now, there is a background of water distress. I foresaw this distress almost eight years ago, that this is going to be happening. And because there is such a distress, both in Chennai and Bangalore is getting there rapidly, I think it'll be a successful process here than anywhere else because you still can't talk to other cities. You must understand this, water distress is not today. You've seen... if you've seen old movies, you will see the women folk are carrying a pot or a bindige, you know, and walking and of course the hero will go romancing, sang songs around her, everything. It's all right for the actress because she's carrying an empty pot. <laughs> but in the village, the woman is carrying fifteen kilograms on her head and walking. No song will come out of her, <laughs> all right? She cannot even open her mouth because she's carrying such a huge weight. So we thought this is romantic. No, every day she spends half her life just carrying water. So in Tamil Nadu, it is very popular in the culture, they'll say if something really nasty is happening in a home or anywhere, they say this is like Kolai Sunday. That is, they go and fight near the tap, the woman. So two women are fighting, they say this is like Kolai Sunday. It's become culture. So when women were fighting, women folk have been fighting, at the taps for a long time, that it's become a cultural thing. Why were they fighting? Is it entertainment? They were not fighting for fun. Every day they have to go and stand near the tap, there's a long queue, but the damn tap is wet only for half an hour, one hour. If it gets over, you have to fight and jump the queue somehow. So when women were fighting, abuses were flowing endlessly. Now men have entered the scene because the situation has become more dire. Once men enter, deaths are happening, they're killing each other. Naturally, women were doing verbal fights, 
Now physical fights are happening. You heard one death happened in Tamil Nadu. Many fights, physical fights have happened. In UP, a pregnant woman was killed just four days ago. Because men are entering the fight now. Now killings will happen. It's not far away when this can happen large scale. Because you must see if we fail to rejuvenate this soil and this water, the civil strife that is waiting on our hands is big. It doesn't matter, cricketers, IPL has grown big, spiritual process is happening, businesses are happening, IT revolution is happening in Bangalore city. Well, in uh, tomorrow, our scientists are uh, putting a moon probe, all this is fantastic. But once water becomes a serious issue, the civil strife is going to pull all these damn things down. It'll put the country back fifty years within a matter of month or two, because the amount of civil strife that will happen, just imagine this. Let's say the villages around run out of water. You think they're just going to sit there and die? They will come on the streets of Bangalore city, isn't it? They will knock on your door, beg you for water. Of course, you won't give because you have limited because you are having shower, no shower, just bucket. <laughs> you won't give water. Then they will bro break down your door. Yes, they will. Let's not underestimate this. This is not to paint a doomsday picture. Because the depletion that is happening at the rate at which it is happening, all studies clearly point out towards a serious water strife. Water strife will naturally transform itself into a civil strife. So whatever each one of us thinking are our achievements in this country, everything will be… become nothing when there is civil strife. You just spoke about cricket, so my mind is stuck there only. Um, <laughs> uh, um, KPL has joined hands with… Wonderful, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> ...calling Kaveri and I'm so happy that they've taken this… taken this step. Um, how do you think KPL or cricket or players from Karnataka will help in this cause? <clears throat> As I said, uh, the most important thing is awareness and support for the plantations. We are pushing with the governments to give subsidies for the plantations to happen, which is very easily doable because no extra or new budget is needed. The existing schemes that are there, little reallocation, there is enough money already there for that. But if we depend on the government to raise these crores of saplings that we need, it's not going to happen. We want to use people, farmers as an economic activity, that this will become an enterprise for many farmers that we will train to do this, that they will not only raise the saplings, they will be knowledgeable enough We're producing videos, how to do agroforestry, there's a whole science to it, how to do it. So we will educate large number of farmers who will start small enterprises of their own, in their own land like five acres, ten acres, they can raise thousands of saplings and this will become an economic process for them. So the most important thing that cricket can do is because uh, mm, the only two things which have huge reach in the country is cricket and cinema probably. Cinema has too many languages, so it is limited to states. Cricket is national, totally, across all boundaries. And uh, just anywhere it will work. So cricketers have a tremendous responsibility and role to play. How you want to do it, I don't want to prescribe to you. But the important action that is needed right now is this, that we need to raise seventy-two crore saplings in the next four years. Four years this plantation must happen means in two years we must raise, in four years the plantation must be over. Then only the twelve-year plan that we have, we will go by that. See, at this stage in my life, twelve-year plan is not a good plan. But <laughs> I've taken this, don't make it twenty years, please make it twelve years, so that uh, the last part of my life I can golf around a little bit and goof around also a little bit. Well, let, let's talk about that, Sadhguru. I know you love riding bikes, I saw the video, you like to play a bit of golf and you were talking to me uh, backstage, you said how much you like cricket but you don't uh, get too much time to watch it. But uh, I think you should… Um, you should go in the middle and uh, hit a few balls on the KPL. Oh, you. 
<laughs> it's like golf, see, but the ball's coming at a... That's what, see that's what... Pace. See, I never took a lesson in golf, nor have I ever been to a driving range, but I have a handicap of nine. So people say, Sadhguru, how's this? How do you do this? So I say, see, when I was young, I played hockey, cricket, football, this, that. There, for twenty-two people, there was only one ball. All the guys were trying to grab the ball. Here, I have my own ball. And there, it was a fast-moving ball. Here, the damn thing is sitting. <laughs> I can hit it. <laughs> but I've, I've played a little golf too, but it's hard. I don't mind the ball. Like, reacting to the ball is easier than... <laughs> than doing something to a ball that is stationary. See, uh, sitting ball hitting becomes difficult because you're juggling too many balls in your head. <laughs> I'm juggling nothing, <laughs> so I hit the damn ball <laughs> Just from a sports point of view, I'd also want to ask about mindset and you know, we, we're constantly traveling, we're constantly playing and mental fatigue, physical fatigue, emotionally we're away from family and friends and there's a lot of things that go on in the mind like you said, there's a lot of balls juggling but it does happen, what, what, what could we do to maybe keep ourselves a little bit more calmer in our heads? Why, I know why, are, you, why are you so unambitious? Why are you saying little bit more calmer? I'll start with little and then I'll <laughs> like your campaign it has to build, so. Now, let's look at it this way. You keep your hand here, if you wish. Does it stay here or does it jump all over the place? It does jump all over the place. It does? Sometimes. Then you will get bolder <laughs> <laughs> Your hand must stay right there where you want it, isn't it? Hand stays but here… No, hand, we're talking about the hand. Yeah. Your hand, you're able to keep it right here. If you want, it'll go here. If you want, it'll go here. If you want, it'll go here. Suppose your hand became like this, it's jumping all over the place. Suppose my hand jumps all over the place, they would think I have some kind of an ailment, isn't it? Hmm? Hand jumping? Yeah. Maybe that Mr. Parkinson is visi visiting us or something <laughs> So, we have to look at this. Unfortunately, in these societies, we think mind jumping all over the place is normal. It's not normal. That's not the way a human mind is made. There are some fundamental aspects which there is no time or space to explore those things here, but we must understand this much. This body and this mind must take instructions from you, isn't it? No? Your… your body and your mind. If it doesn't take instructions from you, this body and this mind, it's more a nuisance than help. Yes? It is more of a nuisance than help. Right now, people are trying to manage the nuisance. As you said, if it becomes little less nuisance, I'm happy. No, it need not be a nuisance. See, the reason why you physically train is so that your body doesn't come in the way, isn't it? See, the idea of training is not to put your body out there, that when I'm performing activity, my body is not in my way. It's not my tripping point. My body is behind me, supporting me, not knocking me down. That's the idea of physical training. Similarly, there should have been substantial mental training, but training means people are having a psychologist. That is when you're ill. Hello? Trying to change attitudes, it's not about attitudes, it's about understanding the mecha mechanism of how this mental structure functions. As physiology functions, the psychological framework functions in a with a certain parameters. If you do not understand that and handle it, then it is only by chance on a certain day you are in the zone. Rest of the time, it's a risk. Rest of the time you're chasing that mindset where, you know, some days, like you said, some days automatically you end up in that mind space, in a good mind space. So, and after that, you know that is where you want to be. So, rest of the time you're chasing it. See, a game is subject to various realities. It's not all you. There's also somebody who's throwing the ball in tricky ways, all right? It's not all you. You're only fifty percent. 
the other fifty percent is there all over the place. So that fifty percent must happen. You cannot do hundred percent. Even if you're as brilliant as you can be, you could be gone first ball. That's the nature of the game, all right? If that nature of the game is removed, then there's no game. If every time you can hit it, then there's no game. You cannot hit it, that is the game, isn't it? So leaving that part, this fifty percent, which is your hundred percent, that must happen every day, even if you change your underwear. I'm saying, whatever that lucky charm that you have, for somebody it, it may be a, some kind of a pendant, somebody it's a mantra, somebody else it's an underwear, it doesn't matter what the hell it is. But you're trying to hang on to something to create some kind of a mental sense of confidence. There are two ways to work. Either you can work with confidence or you can work with clarity. See, right now, if I ask you to walk from here to there or anybody, if I ask them to walk from here to there, they will walk up and down, no problem. Why? It's clear, the lights are on. Suppose we switch off the lights and make this hall pitch dark. If I ask them to walk, now lack… they will struggle. Why? Now they need confidence to take the next step. Why? Because there is no clarity. So people think confidence is a substitute for clarity. It is not. What you need is absolute clarity, not confidence. With confidence, sometimes it may work by chance. It's like, let's say you want to cross the highway where traffic is moving at a certain speed. To build confidence, people have various slogans. Somebody says, uh, Jai Sri Ram, somebody says, Allah Akbar, somebody says something else. You shout one of these things and run across the highway. Maybe you will make it. Hello? Maybe by sheer chance you made it or because of the compassion of some driver, you make it. But if you try every day, we know where to pick you up, <laughs> for sure, isn't it? So similarly, when a bowler bowls a ball, you close your eyes and hit it. Maybe it'll go for a sixer, but if you try every time, we know what, right? This happened <laughs> An American lady came to Bangalore. This was… now those auto rickshaws have gone down. At that time, auto rickshaw was the fastest thing going on the Bangalore roads. It felt fast because it made a lot of noise. It was doing only forty, forty-five kilometers per hour, but because of the way they drove on three wheels, it felt like it's a Formula One or something. So, <laughs> this lady uh, came and uh, this guy is just driving to impress the this uh, foreign lady who has come to the city is trying to impress her with his skills of driving and he is going through everything and so two buses are coming, he goes boom in between and she just screams and yells and all this happened. Then uh, after she got down, she asked him a particular moment when those two buses came, how did you make it? There was hardly any space. He said, I closed my eyes <laughs> So she came and told me, those terrible three-wheelers <laughs> So if you close your eyes, sometimes it just works. So this is what confidence means. I'm sure in every game, people are trying to train people, you must be confident, you must be confident. No, you should not be confident because confident means you are not in touch with realities. Clarity is what is needed because just before the… okay. So we were, uh, you know, like I was talking to a group of uh, journalists and uh, this is at that time when Pakistan was playing in India for the one day internationals which were going on. Sadhguru, how to beat Pakistan? Please tell us. I said, if you want to beat Pakistan, you don't call Indian cricket team, call Indian army, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Why do you want to beat Pakistan? You just have to hit the ball. Hello? You just have to hit the ball. I was uh, training this, uh, you know, 
Indian hockey team and uh, at one time and later after three, four years, I'm walking in Chennai airport, KPS Gill was heading the thing. And all these, the old players who came to us, the senior players, they were all out, whole bunch of young players, almost six or seven of them were all tribal boys from Delhi, Turkey to others, all eighteen to twenty-two age group. These boys are for the first time going out of the country for championships uh, trophy to Germany. They're all wide-eyed, they've never traveled outside and you know, it's the first time. And they're not from cities, they're tribal boys. So somebody is giving them pep talk uh, in Hindi, I can't repeat all the words. He's saying, Deska Ijat Apka something, something. Your parents, your parents' honor is in your hands. One billion people's hopes are in your hands. Like this he is giving pep talk. These boys are <laughs> one billion people's <laughs> stuff <laughs> sitting on their head. Then I was passing by, uh, KPS Gill saw me and said, Sadhguru, can you say something to the boys for the first time they're going out of the country? So I said, see, you know how to play hockey? They said, yes. I said, I don't think you know how to play hockey. You don't know how to play hockey, that's why you're looking like this. You're looking like this because you obviously don't know how to play hockey. No, we know how to play hockey, suddenly they're pride. I said, if you play, know how to play hockey, First thing is forget the one billion people, forget your mabap business. <laughs> There's only one thing, the damn ball should be in the opposite goal, that's all you know. You need lust for this. You just need lust to put the ball in the goal, that's all you do. You don't count how many goals I put, that's not your business. There are professional people hired to keep the score. Why are you keeping the score? Your business is a ball at a time, isn't it? But everybody is calculating, they're looking at the score when I'm coming to hundred. How many really fantastic batsmen unnecessarily have gotten out in nineties in India? So many of them is a legend. I'm guilty of many things. <laughs> <laughs> because you're doing the scorekeeper's work. You do your job. Your job is to hit the ball according to its merit. What does it matter? What's the score? Whether it's one or hundred, what is your business? No, no, you must strategize, all that, there is somebody else. The player has to just do what he has to do at that moment right, isn't it? See, the desire to win is one thing. Everybody wants to win in their life, not just in a game. Everybody wants to win, everybody has a desire to be successful. But the desire is only giving you the direction, which way you want to go. Desire will not make you successful, it's only the competence which makes you successful, isn't it? And competence is clearly clouded when you're confident. Competence needs clarity, you just see things the way they are and do what you have to do at that moment. Not try to win the match, you cannot win the match, you can only hit the ball, isn't it? Somebody will tell you whether you have won or not. This professional happiness makes me the happiest. Being happy with family, that's a different kind of happiness. But when I score or when we win a game, that I feel like I've, I've lost it somewhere. I don't know which makes me more happy. Which obviously winning a game gives me that high. So when you step off the field, when you're with family or friends, not playing cricket, no, nobody watching, that's, that feels a little lesser than that, right? <laughs> why, why would a, why would the mind do that? See whether it's happiness or misery, pain or pleasure, agony or ecstasy, whatever the human experience is caused from within, isn't it? Hmm? It's manufactured by you or no? Yes. So right now, what happens within you needs a push from outside. That is, we must put hundred on the board. Even if it… if it ends at ninety-nine, you will be very miserable, isn't it? You must put hundred on the board, the crowd should roar and we must be declared the winners. This is an impossible condition for your happiness. 
isn't it? <laughs> That's not going to happen every day. <laughs> For nobody it will happen every day, isn't it? Nobody it is going to happen every day, even if you're a superman, it won't happen every day. So happiness is a condition within you, it's like this. See, it's a question of pleasantness. Why I'm saying pleasantness is because there's substantial, there is substantial evidence, medical and scientific evidence to show only in pleasant states of experience, your body and your mind will function at its best. There's enough evidence about that. So if you want to play cricket well or anything well, you must be able to harness this body and this brain. That's the only way, isn't it? If you harness this body's prowess and the mental prowess in the right sense, that action will happen in the best possible way for any human being, whatever the nature of activity. Now, pleasant states of experience means this, if body is pleasant, we call this health, is needed. Hello? You want... You want to be pleasant in your body or no? If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If your mind is pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If your emotions are pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your very life energies are pleasant, we call this bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings are pleasant, we call this success. Right now what you're doing is, you are going for the last one, success. <laughs> to create the last pleasantness around us, let's say in this hall we want a pleasant atmosphere, we need the cooperation of all these people, otherwise it won't happen, isn't it? But I want to be pleasant in my body, mind, emotion and energy, is one hundred percent my business, isn't it? This one thing if you do, that your body, mind, emotion and energies are always pleasant. Now, outside pleasantness, it's a question of skill. It's a question of times in which we exist, I'm saying. Suppose you were here in Bangalore city, let's say five hundred years ago, you wouldn't be playing cricket, maybe you would be breaking cro coconuts or something, I don't know. Yes or no? So what we are doing right now, is just a consequence of time, isn't it? Because of the times in which we exist, we are doing certain things, that's not the important thing. The important thing is, my body, my mind, my emotion, my energies are at highest level of pleasantness. If it's like this, if I'm ecstatic, will I hit the ball well? What do you think? I think so. Yes, one hundred percent. Because your body and your mind will not come in your way. There are other things, of course. Outside situations are there. Maybe it's a ball that nobody can hit sometimes. That's a different matter. But you are not the issue. This one thing everybody must do in their life, in your life, you're not the issue. There are thousand other issues to handle. But this should not be the issue. Once this is not the issue, you will effortlessly handle other issues. This doesn't mean everything will work your way, but what best you can do will happen in your life. As I said earlier, what we cannot do, it did not happen, that doesn't matter. What we can do did not happen, this is a disaster, isn't it? So my last question before they can ask you some question. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on uh, how this forty-two rupees will be used in the project and you some more light on that. Uh, the detailed br uh, breakup we can give, this involves this kind of activity. One thing is, our volunteers are on the ground. Um, let me explain what is a volunteer. When we did the rally for rivers, the entire Isha Foundation is a volunteer force. But apart from that, when we went for rally for rivers, I gave a call to the youth of this nation that for three years, if you can focus your life on India's rivers, we can make a huge difference. 
So they said, but Sadhguru, we don't know anything about river, we don't know what is environment, how to fix it, what... I said, you don't worry about that, we run a four-month-long training programs for this. I said, there's only one qualification you need, that is, you must suspend one thought in your head, that is, what about me? This one thought you suspend for three years, I will see, we will make you into Nadivira. Hundreds of them came forth, many of them resigned well-paying jobs, a few of them halfway through their PhDs, they dropped their studies and they are with us. Now, if our Kaveri calling, we are going to call many, many more. In Yavatmal region, they are... they are meeting every family. They are just on the ground meeting every family in the region to make sure they know what they need to do to come out of their present situation. This is what has not happened in this country. The last mile, nobody is willing to walk. Somebody makes the policy up there, somebody allots the finance, somebody eats up half of it somewhere, all kinds of things happen. But nobody is going to that last man and telling him what he needs to do. What is it that he needs to do? Unless he does the right thing, unless he does the right thing, there is no solution. It is just academic, we are just talking about it. Solution will happen only when it touches the last man. Fortunately today, we have various kinds of mediums through which we can communicate. We don't have to necessarily physically meet five million farmers in this region. We can communicate in many different ways, we will be using every possible means to do that. So all this costs money, but that is not the major thing. The major thing is, we need to lease large tracts of lands, and you need soil in most of the places where they give you land, the soil is not suitable, so you will have to transport soil. So you need transportation and whole infrastructure to do that. All this we are doing on a certain scale in Tamil Nadu already, but this scale needs a huge push. So these forty-two rupees, how it is managed is, we have a board of people, a, a responsible board, in this, there is a Supreme Court judge, there is the World Wildlife Fund chairperson, there is a chairperson of uh, your... Uh, your star woman entrepreneur in your city, uh, Kiran Majumdar is on it. We have two former chairpersons of ISRO, that is the Indian Space Research Organization. We have the topmost water expert in the country. We have a person who started the farmer producer organization movement, he's considered the father of uh, FPOs. So there is a responsible board. This entire Kaveri Calling Fund is going to be managed by an internationally reputed auditing firm under the aegis of this board. This Kaveri Calling account is not managed by Yesha Foundation or me or anybody concerned with me. This is managed by this group of people and we are also bringing in few more people from Karnataka and Tamil Nadu to be a part of this uh, management. So, it is being managed in a responsible way, the way it should be, and accounts will be put on for public viewing, because an international uh, accounting firm is going to manage this. So, nobody need to fear what will happen to the money, if that is a concern. They need not fear, this is the best way to do it. And uh, how exactly this forty-two rupees will get divided? We must understand this on the ground realities, in different kinds of lands, in different kinds of terrains, in different kinds of social situations, this money will vary. In some place we may be able to manufacture, I mean to be able to produce a sapling for twenty-five rupees, in some place it may be hundred rupees. So on this, on an average we have calculated forty-two rupees. So, this variation will happen, it's not like exactly everything will cost. See, for example, this involves about fifteen different kinds of species of trees, the agroforestry basic module. The larger module involves about eighty different species of trees. There are some species of trees that we can make it for five rupees. There are places where our volunteers are doing, where uh, every weekend thousands of them will come together and produce this uh, at their own cost. This one may happen for five rupees. There is another kind of timber tree which will take probably two hundred rupees. So calculating all this, we have arrived at this forty-two rupee number. So it should not be looked at, okay, this is only this much packet, why did it cost forty rupees? That's not the way, on an average. But the important thing is, 
it is well managed by the most responsible people that you can find in the country. Any fantastic question, please put your hands up and microphone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Pranam Sadhguru. Hello, Rahul. My name is Dhanush. Uh, my question is, it's, uh, it's relating to an article published in today's Hindu newspaper, The Hindu. It's about uh, reforestation in Philippines. So in 1900, 65% of Philippines was covered with forest. In uh, 1987, due to commercial deforestation, it was reduced to 21%. So after that, which government uh, took an initiative and by 2010, it was increased to 26%, which is a uh, average growth. So Philippines has now introduced a program in which it makes, makes it mandatory for each elementary, high school and college student to plant 10 trees before graduating. So the sites where to plant is, uh, plant the, are uh, advised to them by government. So as Rahul pointed out in today's conversation, what a com common man can do and uh, the framework which you replied as to 242 crore trees has to be planted in next 12 years. So it's I consider it's a matter of choice, like we can do it or we may not do it. So why not, uh, uh, given the unconscious scale in which humanity is living today and the immediate need for redressing the environmental chaos, isn't compulsion as in a law the best way out so why not make planting trees or saving a river a compulsion maybe by a law as in philippines thank you uh, they are filipinos we are indians <laughs> you're underestimating us <laughs> it's very different and above all you must understand this See, there is no forest land, very little forest land is left to do plantations. For example, in Kaveri Basin, only twenty percent is forest land. Out of this, eight percent has good forest, we don't even have to touch it. Another four or five percent is mildly denuded forest, some replantation could happen there. Another three, four percent is totally denuded forest, which must be replanted. This is not the challenge. This can be easily done because this land is dedicated for forest. It belongs to the forest department or the state government. It can be easily planted, that's not the challenge at all. I know everywhere on the WhatsApp and other things, somebody comes up with a drone, we can shoot this, we can shoot... You don't need any of those things. With the kind of population we have, we can organize that the forest lands are replanted. That's not a big deal. But over eighty percent of the land is agriculture. This is the thing we need to understand because all the time these activists and others are going on trying to hit some industry. Because hitting an industry is a kind of a... you know, it's a fashionable thing in the country. When you want to hit somebody, hit some industry and say, they're doing this, they're doing that. Though all of us are consuming those products. You must understand, industry in India occupies less than one percent of the land. Agriculture in India occupies eighty-four percent of the land. People do not know the difference between polluting the river and depletion of rivers. For example, in, in Bangalore city, you had over one thousand lakes about seventy years ago, today you have eighty lakes left. Out of these eighty, only seventeen lakes have fresh water. The remaining lakes have sewage water. So you still have a lake only because of sewage. People think the water is polluted. No, there is only sewage water. If sewage water is stopped, there will be no lake. Well, I want you to understand this. Where is your bus stand? You know, the bus station, the Subhashnagar bus station. Huh? Dharmambodhi Lake, all right. Those of you who come from Mysore, where is your... Uh, what, uh, exhibition? Lake? Where is your playground? Lake? So we think we're doing great, <laughs> all right? <laughs> you need to understand all the lakes in the city have been turned into bus stands, playgrounds, all kinds of things. These were all active, full water lakes just thirty, forty years ago. So, in India, compulsory plantation... Okay, you can make it compulsory, where do I go and plant? 
So, in Tamil Nadu, we started this scheme today. I think uh, I... how many green schools does somebody know? Any of the volunteers, please? A few thousand, I don't know how many exactly. A few thousand schools, we have given the certificate, this is a green school. How somebody... a school becomes a green school is that if they plant ten thousand trees from the school, they become a green school. Where do they plant these ten thousand trees? So they raise ten thousand saplings and distribute to the local farmers and ensure it is planted. It is all planted in different lands, but ten thousand trees have gone. If the school takes care of this, this becomes a green school. And we started another scheme, see, children like pets. If you get a dog or a cat in India, in villages and small towns, Though a dog's life may be twelve, fourteen, fifteen years, most of them get run over by the time they're six or seven years of age. So you are loud pet, get crushed on the street, you feel terrible. Everybody goes through a twelve-year heartbreak with dogs and cats. <laughs> so I brought this idea, you have a tree as a pet. It'll grow bigger than you, it'll live beyond you, you can enjoy it all your life and you will be doing a great service to the land and the people and the animals and every other life. You must understand this one tree, one tropical tree in this country, if you plant a tree, in twelve years time, whatever its reasonable size of growth if it has, in twelve years time it is able to sequester somewhere between thirty-eight thousand to forty-five thousand liters of water. So when we talk about this 242 crore trees, what it means is it can sequester anywhere between 9 to 12 trillion liters of water. To give you a perspective, right now Kaveri River that is flowing, the total volume of water in the Kaveri River is 21.2 trillion liters. If in 12 years you plan this number, and wait for another six, seven years' time, you will have Kaveri flowing full on. But we must understand, we must have that much commitment. Most of the policies and activities we are doing is from election to election. There is no long-term commitment to anything. But m I'm sure most of you have children. If not for my country, at least for your children, please do something. So it's not about making it compulsory. So you're assuming that you will not do anything. We are given to not doing anything. Why? That's not the case. I must tell you this. When I started for Rally for Rivers, all our people very apprehensive, Sadhguru, nationwide, will they respond? If they don't respond, what I said, you don't worry about that. They said, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, they will respond. Once you go north, you can't speak Hindi. How will they respond? Who will respond? like this kind of fears. I said, you don't bother about those things. <laughs> One hundred and sixty-two million people responded. Never before for any moment in thirty days' time, hundred and sixty-two million people responded. So as I went, what I saw was, it was phenomenal to see this, because in every village, men, women, children waiting, I, I must tell you this, it, it really... Every day when I saw certain people, tears came to me because I'm driving around, you know, I drove 9,300 kilometers in 30 days and I have no spare driver, I drive all the way. And I did 142 events in these 30 days, 184 television and news interviews, literally every minute I was driving, I was also talking and doing interviews to radios, televisions and everything. All this and our volunteers were on the ground and maximizing that. Like I'm somewhere in Madhya Pradesh in some remote place, it's already around 1.30 in the night, so it's late and we've still not gotten to the destination, so I'm really banging it, I mean the car. That was also a big controversy with lots of people, why are you not driving a Maruti? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm really banging it like I'm doing like 130, 140. And it's raining, it's raining quite heavily. Then I just flash by 
and I see this blue patch, you know, right now it's become Kaveri calling, it used to be just rally for rivers. I see a few blue patches, I just whiz past. Then I have twenty cars behind me, they're all coming a little behind. And then I stop and try to back up. So this whole con convoy has to back up. Then I back up there. Then I... S you know, I've already gone literally another three hundred, four hundred meters and back up. And there then old lady, must be over sixty-five kind of lady, a village person, and a twelve-year-old girl, and one seven, eight-year-old boy, all three of them holding rally for rivers and waiting at one thirty in the night. What do you do with these people? <laughs> I'm saying that's a commitment people have. If you do it the right way and people will respond. And all of you educated people who live in Bangalore, whatever I am saying today, you take this commitment, you'll at least make it hundred times over, <laughs> amplify it. The entire nation responded that way only because that many people were behind the movement. The governments acted with such agility. I gave the Rally for Rivers document, which is a seven hundred and sixty page recommendations for how to manage rivers. When I gave this to the Prime Minister at 6.20 in the evening, I put it in his hand. Next day morning by 11.30, we get a call from the Prime Minister's office that he's formed a special committee and they want the soft copy. I thought, this is fantastic <laughs> And uh, within about twelve to fifteen days, it was in the hands of Niti Aayog where I went and addressed all the ministries who were there as to how to put this together. They put this through the scientific process tests and the economic uh, tests. Once it passed, in about two and a half months time, less than two and a half months time, Rally for Rivers recommendation in total, without one word changing, it went as an rec official recommendation to all the twenty-nine states. Four states. Four states are proactive and they're doing good work. Another four or five states, we have MOUs, we are working with them. Rest of them are little... that includes you, little sleepy mode. We need a crisis. We need a crisis to act. Well, right now Chennai has run out of water. Tamil Nadu people will act now, I know. Will Karnataka wait for Bangalore to go dry and then act or are we sensible enough to act now? This is all the question is. So make it compulsory for the children, why? We are the ones who destroyed this land, isn't it? Hello? We as a generation have destroyed this land, why are you thinking children should plant? They will be most willing if you just tell them, okay? We will do that, every school, every college, all these things we will do but you're talking about making it compulsory. Is it not a shame that it has to be compulsory that we should take care of our children's well future? It should be compulsory, you must care for your children. How bad is that? I don't want to do that. I don't want it to be compulsory. If you want to destroy this land, if you want to take away the future of the people of this land, I want you to understand, people have money and means, they're all transporting their children to other countries. but. There are millions and millions of people here who cannot do that, a billion people who cannot do that. And as I said earlier, before the civil strife breaks out in a big way, when it'll be out of control, you can neither apply… First thing when in India, when civil strife happens, they'll cut the trees and throw it on the highway. <laughs> At that time, you can't talk to them, plant a tree, do this, do that nonsense. Right now, it's still in control. This is the time to do it. There is a solution. Sadhguru. Uh, my question was like, obviously in a city environment, we always find it very constrained where to put the plants and how do we engage. I remember when I was in school, uh, we had planted trees and when I went there back after 10 years, I could still see that tree and it happened with all of my friends. And there was always an emotional connect with that, okay, you know what, these are the trees that we have planted. In a city, obviously there is a responsibility aspect of it, but uh, how can, do you have any special uh, ideas about like 
where can we help in the sampling part of it, like uh, 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 putting the sam uh, saplings, or yes. where is the land to uh, plant <laughs> those trees, so that at least we can feel the action ourselves, not only just about, okay, not so, the action, something is There are two ways to do this now. One thing is you just contribute 42 rupees per sapling. I'm not saying only 42. What, how many trees do you want to do? That many. That's one way to do it. But you don't have the money, but you have the time, all right? This is always the case. Those who have the money don't have the time, those who have the time don't have the money <laughs> So, uh, you don't have the money. Can't you raise when twenty-five saplings in your home and after one year, you hand it over to us. We… we will… we will hold schemes and plans for all these things, how every citizen can participate, how every adult, child, man, woman, everybody can participate. These things will be unleashed, we will put it on the social media, how to do it, where to do it, everything. But in your home, even if you're living in an apartment home, twenty-five saplings you could raise, isn't it? You will have the joy of seeing them growing in your balcony, possible or no? Even if you have a two-bedroom house, you can still do it, yes or no? So you either give the money or where we will do it in large-scale nurseries, which is more efficient way of doing because gathering this from every home is going to be a serious challenge because transporting saplings long distances is going to cost us so much. We will be having nurseries all along the Kaveri Basin, which is eighty-three thousand square kilometers. I want you to understand the scale. You understand? It's eighty-three thousand square kilometers of land because this is a serious problem that in people's understanding, why we took up Vagari River is it because it's a tributary. See, people, if you say rivers, you say, tell, ask anybody, what are the rivers in India? They will say Ganga, Narmada, Godavari, Krishna, Kaveri. You must understand, Kaveri has one hundred and twenty major tributaries and thousands of small tributaries. If the tributaries don't flow, Kaveri will not flow. Kaveri is only a destination, it's not a source. So, the basin includes all these 120 tributaries. If you don't enrich them, people think we are going to plant just on the side of Kaveri river bank, that's not how it is. That is a simplistic campaign we did with Rally for Rivers, just to make people understand one kilometer on either side. That is not the plan. You must understand this, this idea, this idea that catchment means people think it's somewhere in Madikeri or that uh, Kurg area, that one valley is catchment. No, in tropical land, every square inch of land is catchment. You need to catch the water that comes down and hold it in the land, put it into the land because it is not just the river, it is the aquifers. If the aquifers are not full, they will suck away all the river water. Water is not just about river. Right now, we are using Kaveri as an emotional pitch, but the real thing is, the soil should become enriched to hold water and it is everywhere. That wherever you dig, there must be water, then only Kaveri will flow, otherwise she will not flow, land will suck it out. So, we will come out with all those things. But I want you to understand, all those things become more… See, suppose you raise twenty or fifty saplings in your house, for us to take it and plant it somewhere, because you will raise one species. Now that one species needs a mix of another twelve, fifteen species, because otherwise agroforestry will not work. For the farmer, in four years there is a crop, in seven years there is a crop, in ten years there is a crop like this. For this, we need various levels of species. And there are other grasses and bushes which also add to this. If you grow in your house, we… I'm not discouraging you, you must do that. We want that people's participation. But practically, that is not the best way to do. It must be located where we want. Otherwise, transporting one sapling from this place to that place, in the city we have to come and gather it from you. That's going to cost us a lot of money. Well, we can do it on a voluntary basis that all of you bring it to one place, but that preservation, you… let's say we gather it in some school ground, we have to water those saplings. If we cannot water, there it starts drying up, then the media will start making scandal out of it. See, these people got the saplings and they couldn't water it. I'm saying there are many complexities. I want you to understand, I'm made like this, when I sit down and look at something, I think of every damn problem there is. 
every damn problem there is. I don't tell all those problems to everybody around me because they will fear it will not happen. <laughs> For every problem there is a solution. It is just that we need to do in that precise manner, all right? Ask him, for every ball does he hit the same shot? Hello? No, for every ball there is a precise shot. Last shot was a great shot. This shot, the ball was different, if you try the same shot, you're back home, <laughs> isn't it? The same goes for every aspect of life. This strategic approach to ecological issues in the country has just never happened, do you understand, till now. This is the time to do it. If uh, Rahul and his team really pitches for it, I think half a billion saplings will happen because at least there are half a billion people who will do it if they just say it. <laughs> Hey, what are you doing here? Came to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two questions. One is when are we playing golf next? I'm playing tomorrow, it's up to you. Okay. My second question regarding uh, Kaveri calling is uh, what would… how would you influence a fractured government that Karnataka is blessed with uh, to come forward and do something like even having subsidies for example? Uh, what happened in Coog? in August. I don't go so, there, don't go there. No, I need to go there because there's something very important that happened. What happened in Coog in August had collected 350 crores in the chief minister's fund. 10% reached the people. Now we have a fractured government where we don't have the confidence the government will do something. So if you have a movement like Kaveri calling, how do you propose that you would be able to influence this fractured government to do something? People's involvement will be there because we collected 190 crores out of 350 crores that came to the chief minister's fund, but okay. nothing came to the people. So about fractured uh, political situations, see we must understand this, we have to work with the realities in which we live. I am not someone who asked for an ideal situation. I've always worked with the realities that exist right now. I must tell you this, we are a volunteer organization, about forty-six hundred full-time volunteers and over nine to eleven million part-time volunteers. That means <laughs> that simply means a whole variety of concoction of people. Every day somebody will come up to me and say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she is impossible, I can't do it. So I just… slowly they've all gotten this now. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the kind of people, they are there, like this kind, this kind, this kind, this kind, this is how they are in this world. If you think your work is significant, what you're doing is significant, you have to work with these kind of people. None of them are okay, none of, are, none of them are perfect people, everybody has their own nonsense. You have to work with these people. But if you think you want to work with perfect people, you must go to heaven and today <laughs> So you drop this angst. In the existing reality, how to make them something work is success, isn't it? If I had an ideal situation, I would have done this, that, that. That is not success, that is just wishful thinking, isn't it? Hello? In the given situation, we made something happen, this is success. Now if there was that kind of situation, I would have done this. This is just wishful thinking, isn't it? So let's not waste time on that. One way or the other, in the next couple of weeks, it'll sort itself out. Right now this thing for incentives for the farmers, I think in Tamil Nadu it's moving in the right direction, simply because the crisis is staring in the face. So they understand action is inevitable, there's no more a choice. So they're moving, they're faster, 
going not as fast as I want, but it's going there before September, I think we will achieve that, the incentives for the farmers. Because the budgetary requirement is not challenging. In Karnataka, we have presented this to, to the government, but as you said, it's fractured. When there is a fracture, there is pain. When there is pain, people don't do anything. <laughs> uh, that is a reality, but the thing will happen, there is time. So, we have a counter plan for this. If the incentive comes, we will go about campaigning in every village in the Kaveri Basin. I want you to understand, this covers over one hundred taluks. So this is many, many, many villages and over five million farmers, but we will campaign in such a way every one of them will get the message that there is an incentive. And of course, government machinery also will announce that there is an incentive. Our business is to go and explain how to harness the incentive that's given. Because in this country, most of the incentive that the government has given, various schemes where thousands of crores are sitting, people do not know how to harness it. Because there is a huge problem of uh, you have to fill uh, 112 applicable forms and not everybody has the endurance to last for the century of farms. <laughs> they get, just get beaten halfway down, okay? So we will see how to facilitate this. But suppose they do not announce the incentive, then we are using the rally as a way to put pressure on the government. So both ways you must be with me, you understand? If the incentive comes, it is about doing activity. If the incentive doesn't come, it's about putting pressure on the government. Both ways it must work. Only then it's going to happen because this is the realities of the nation. We better learn to work in that. I have two questions. Um, one is... Uh... You, you know, you, have you seen Lady Gaga? <laughs> huh? Have you? So you must hold the microphone like this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, the first question is, uh, yes, ma uh, many people will support this um, uh, the, uh, this campaign and this um, uh, for planting the trees. But um, how can you, how can we assure that these trees which we plant will not get cut? And um, the no, they will be cut. <laughs> Agroforestry means they will be cut. I want you to understand this. Why will I plant? trees in my land that I cannot cut. Why will I do it? This is why nobody is planting. If only I can cut it and use it, and it's an economic process for me, I will cut and I will plant and I will cut and I will plant, this culture will continue. If you don't allow me to cut, why will I plant? Because first of all, you must understand, there is no free terrain for you to plant millions of trees. There is no such place in the country. If you want a farmer who has small patches of land to plant a tree, he must have the right to cut. This is a law that we're trying to change. Right now, there are laws that if you cut a tree in your own land, they will arrest you. We want that to go absolutely, we've released eighteen species, but we want to release everything. That I can grow what I want and cut it when I want, and I do whatever I want with what I cut, it's nobody's business. Only then farmers will grow trees, not otherwise. So only city people are thinking that farmers should plant trees in their land and not cut it so that you can go and enjoy it. it doesn't work like that, it's his land, it's his livelihood. <laughs> it must be cut, that's what I'm saying. Um, and the second question is that you mentioned about confidence and clarity. Um, my question is, how can we achieve clarity? Hmm? Will you please sit down? See, uh, suppose your eyes are a little foggy, you go and get glasses, isn't it? Suddenly you wore your prescription glasses, suddenly everything is clear. So you did not improve the world, you only improved your eyesight, isn't it? Hello? Suddenly the world looks better. The world you did not improve in any sense, so you must understand, Confidence is about action. This is not about action, this is about the way I am. My eyes are clear. What I will do with it? 
I may plant trees, I may hit a cricket ball, I may hit a golf ball, or I may drive, I may do whatever nonsense I want, all right? The important thing is my eyes are clear. So I'm only enhancing my faculty. I'm not thinking of what to do. What to do is my choice. It is individual choice, everybody can do what they want to do. But your faculties must not become cloudy. One reason why, because uh, this question came in terms of cricket, and this is very true with every aspect of life also is, your education systems have confused you that memory is intelligence. You remember some rubbish that you have read and write it, you're first rank. I never understood why I should write what I know. I never wrote anything in my test papers, always consistently I got six zeros throughout my education because I didn't understand why I have to vomit whatever I think I've read. <laughs> so, we have misunderstood memory as intelligence. All these people are going to have a deep shock in the next few years because artificial intelligence is coming. My phone has hundred times more memory than you. That's why it's a smart phone. You call somebody smart only because it's smarter than you, isn't it? <laughs> Hello? You will say somebody is smart. Why? He's smarter than you. That's why you're calling somebody a smart. If he was not smarter than you, you won't say he is smart, isn't it so? You will say he's dumb. So phone has become smarter than you simply because your idea of education is just to remember a few things. By reading ten books, somebody becomes a scholar. By reading hundred books, somebody becomes a doctor. By just reading one book, somebody becomes a representative of God. <laughs> yes, unfortunately <laughs> This is the best qualification you can get. By reading one book, you become God's representative on the planet. Fantastic, isn't it? So, all those people who are living by memory are going to feel utterly stupid in the next five, ten years. It's time you do some inner engineering to be relevant in this world, otherwise you'll become irrelevant. They're inviting me to all kinds of artificial intelligence conferences in the world and they're asking me to speak about this and that. I said, why are you inviting me to artificial intelligence? I'm not artificial intelligence. They say, no, no, Sadhguru, the problem is what will we do? Professors and scholars and others, they're worried, what will we do? Well, you'll have nothing much to do, you'll be of no significance, it's just like this. See, let's say five hundred years ago, if you had really big muscles like that, we would make you king of Bangalore because you're so muscular. Today, maybe we'll uh, put you at the gate of this hotel as a security man. <laughs> That's the best job you can get <laughs> So I'm saying <laughs> bouncer <laughs> So, man's muscle lost relevance because why machines came, isn't it? The power of the machine neutralized man's muscle. This is the reason why so many women are sitting here today. Not because of some liberalization that's happened, simply technology, machines came and neutralized the power of man's muscle and suddenly women also can come and sit here. Yes, that's a reality. Now people who have instead of muscle, now the sh focus has shifted to memory. Those who have a certain amount of memory, they're strutting around. Even when I was in school, I always wondered, these people who just read a book a few years ahead of me, why are they strutting around like they're superior human beings? All this nonsense will go with artificial intelligence. You need to have something worthwhile within you, not memory. If you say something from your memory, I will pull out my little gadget, it knows everything that you know. Today, nobody is consulting their grandparents and parents for anything, they're asking Alexa, tell me this <laughs> Yes or no? So, you need to understand this, that clarity will come to you only when you're not contaminated by memory when you know how to keep your memory aside. 
and simply look at things. This needs little training. Your edu education systems have messed you up, making you misunderstand memory as intelligence. Intelligence is a different dimension, memory is a different dimension. These two things, if you hold it separately, you will be crystal clear every moment of your life. Hmm? I hope the Karnataka Premier League, I've never watched uh, Karnataka Premier League matches, maybe I'll get to watch something. We'll be grateful if you could come for the finals and matches. When is that? It's on the first. First of? First of September. September. Whoa. So you want me to start the rally two days early? <laughs> we want to be in Kurgan second, I think it's possible. It's what, what is it? It's… it's twenty… twenty twenty. Lit, is it? Yeah. Flood lit in the evening. I think I'm there then, first September. <laughs> Positive. Positive. Beyond is, beyond is beautifully made in the middle of the university. Where is the… which is the ground you're playing? We're playing the Mysore University and you have the ground. But that's not… Uh, there's no grass in it. I played… It's now is it? Now we Oh, we all played on rough ground and <laughs> half my knee skin have left there. <laughs> Uh, okay, anyway, we… With the… what do you call it? KP? KPL. KPL, KPL, Premier League. So, we wish you all the best. I heard that it's on till twenty… two thousand nine, right? That's what they said. So, let this happen. I think finals, I'll be there. First September, I'm on the way anyway. So, uh, it's important that the cricketing world stands up for this. And uh, this is not one day's work. As I said, this Kaveri is a twelve-year project. I feel in a matter of five to six years, if we have pushed it to a certain volume, the rest of the country and the rest of the rivers and river basins will pick it up by themselves. It's bound to happen. We will make certain policy changes at the center level, but the problem is river is a concurrent subject. That is between the center and state. Center can only recommend, it's the state that needs to act. So the political scenario in the country is such now, most of the states are ruled by one party. I think this is the best time to make it happen, because if we convince the center, it can happen on all these states uh, quite effortlessly. So we're… Uh, that way, I think politically, we're in a good space for a national movement, but we need to show Karnataka and Tamil Nadu has this responsibility of showing a massive level of success then only it will take off everywhere else. Namaskar, I'm Sadhguru. Uh, I just wanted to ask you one thing. What are, we, what are your views on the Meki Datu project which is being planned by the Karnataka government and it is said that it… the Karnataka government is claiming that it will end the Bangalore water wars, but it is vehemently opposed by the Tamil Nadu state government and it's also said that this project will wipe out 52 square kilometers of coal forest area. I just wanted to know how this Kaveri Calling initiative will address this. See, everywhere in the world, people have understood what is the science of hydrology. And whatever they did hundred years ago, they're all changing it. In United States, over nine hundred major dams have been decommissioned because they see this is the most disastrous thing you can do. In India's geography, almost there's simply no room for building more dams unless you want to completely destroy everything. You must understand, an average temperature of over thirty-two to thirty-five degrees when it is there, if you hold water in a large lake, the evaporation in about ninety days is appro approximately sixty-five percent. So you want to evaporate all the land, all the water that is flowing through this, this is all knee-jerk kind of thing. So you're only talking further about how to exploit more. Instead of seeing how to revitalize, we're still thinking how to exploit more because most governments unfortunately think election to election. There is no long-term thought. 
But we must understand ec ecological situations have to be thought fifty to hundred years at least. At least fifty to hundred years. You can't think three to four years. This is three to four year thought. Right now we are in power. The problem is just this. See, if you... if a, a particular government or all of you, if you plant millions of trees, your nameplate will not grow on the tree. That's a problem with the tree. But if you build a dam, you can carve it on the stone and put it there. Many dams in Karnataka have gone dry, all right, already. But your nameplate is there. This foolish man built this dam. <laughs> I want you to understand, there was a time, there was a time when... when the English suddenly left us in 1947, there's no infrastructure in the country. Something had to be done to survive. That time we did desperate things, built all kinds of dams, whatever. It's okay what we have done, we don't have to do post-mortem of that. But that time is over. Now, there is a whole deeper understanding of everything, how it works. Now you're still talking about what, it, what we did fifty years ago and say, I will do the same thing. Because you have no sense of what's happening now in the world. And this is a tropical country. Holding water is not the solution. We need to generate water in the groundwater. We must understand India is the only country which is exploiting over eighty percent of groundwater. I'll tell you my experience in Bangalore. This is almost forty years ago when I was doing... Con when I was running a construction uh, business. And we got some contract in Majestic area. We were supposed to put concrete columns. We just dug five, six feet. It's full of water. You won't believe this. Every pit we put ten HP diesel engine motors, but we could not empty the water we could not put concrete into that. That's how it was. Today, I don't know, maybe you have to go five hundred feet at least. Huh? In this city area? Thousand feet. So, you know what you have done. <laughs>